Welcome everyone to NSTA Web Seminars where you can find live interactive learning at your desktop. Today's presentation is part of our series on the NGSS core ideas and our focus is ecosystems, interactions, energy, and dynamics. Our featured presenters today are Andy Anderson and Jennifer Doherty, and Ted Willard is also online with us to provide information about the standards and, and facilitate some Q&A. My name is Brent Slate. I will be moderating the program, and Jeff Lehman is also with us to provide technical support. Uh, before we get into the presentation, I just wanted to give everyone a quick reminder about the NSTA Learning Center, which is your online portal for teacher professional learning. And we do have over 11,300 resources currently available. That number goes up all the time, and almost 4,000 are for free. Uh, once you get resources in your library in the Learning Center, you can bundle those into collections around a theme, and then you can um, have easy access to your resources and even share those with other users of the Learning Center, as well as accessing collections that others have put together. So um, take advantage of those by um, navigating to the, to the Learning Center. Um, also wanted to remind everybody that there are community forums in the Learning Center where you can discuss issues with other science teachers. And we do have online advisors who are available during um, set hours via our live support button, and they can help you find what you're looking for there in the Learning Center, so take advantage of them. Um, we also have free tools that can help you organize what you're doing on your per professional learning and to reach your goals. All of it is available by going to learningcenter.nsga.org. Now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our presenters for today. We have Ted Willard, who's our director of NGSS at NSTA. And then our feature presenters are both from Michigan State University. We have Andy Anderson and Jennifer Doherty here to share with us about ecosystems. At this point, I will turn it over to Ted to get us started. Welcome, Thanks, Ted. Ben. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Great to be talking some more about biology and, and, and GSS and getting some sense of what the display core ideas in biology are. I'm going to give a quick little intro here to just make sure we're on the same page about the standards. The standards themselves were developed by a group of four organizations, the National Academies, ACHIEVE, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, my favorite, NSTA. And there's a two-step process in the development of these standards. The first was the development of a framework for K-12 science education by the academies, which came out a couple of years ago, and then the standards themselves. And assessment, curricula, instruction, teacher, professional development, all of these different elements come out of and will need to change and to reflect what's going on with these standards. Well, let's take a look first at the framework and get a sense of that. The key piece, I, I should say here, if you, I'm hoping that you have looked at the framework, that you've read the framework. Um, there's really no excuse not to. There, you can get a free copy of it from the National Academies Press. Or if you're someone who likes to ha hold something in your hand, you can get a print copy from NSTA Press and go to the NSTA store. But the framework itself has three dimensions, science and engineering practices, cross-cutting concepts, and disciplinary core ideas. And these three different elements are meant to be woven together through science education. So the science and engineering practices, you know, things like asking questions, developing models, analyzing data, constructing up explanations, and engaging in argument, these are things that students are supposed to be able to do in their classroom as a me means of gaining an understanding of the disciplinary core ideas. They also are goals in and of themselves. There is knowledge and skills that students need to have to be able to do these. And in many ways, it's learning how to learn you know, these practices. Um, I strongly recommend taking a look at um, some of our previous web seminars about the practices if you want to get a handle on some of these. The same is true for cross-cutting concepts. We have web seminars on those. But these are things like patterns, scale, systems, structure and function, things that aren't unique to life science or physical science or earth science, but cut across all of those different disciplines. And then we have the piece that probably most people are most familiar with is the core ideas themselves, life science, physical science, earth and space science. And engineering and technology is taking a place in these standards in a similar way, side by side with all of these. 
So let's look at some of the standards. I'm sure she mentioned here that each of these topics, like life science, breaks down into farther pieces. So we've got ecosystems, which we're talking about tonight, and that breaks further down. I think you'll hear some more about that as the evening goes on. But the key piece is all of those elements were, des were described in the framework. And then the standards went on to develop standards around those different elements, those different dimensions. And so 26 states worked together on the standards. There was a committee uh, with a representative from each state, usually the science, state science supervisor, who really made decisions about what the standards should be like. And then each state had a review committee that would work through and provide feedback of the standards. And then there were 41 writers spread across the country working on the standards. And you can see where they were all from. And we're now at the stage the standards are complete of having adoptions. We've got the District of Columbia, which is really tiny to see over here as a green dot. But the District of Columbia, as well as eight other states that are a lot easier to make out, have adopted the states. And then the states here in yellow have taken some sort of, of action towards adoption. And you know, our working in more states are expected down the line here, so to be to be aware of it. The states here, this already represents 20% of the students in the country. All right. So here's an example of what the standards look like. We've got a performance expectation. And this is a statement, and I've got a little note down here, that these combine all three elements and they describe what is to be assessed. They're not telling you what students should be doing as part of their instruction. They're not telling the teacher what they have to do in their classroom. The teacher has total control to make decisions about that. But instead, this performance expectation is saying what students should be able to do at the end of instruction. But this performance expectation combines different pieces here. Let's look. Develop, and develop molecular models of reactants and products to support the explanation that atoms and therefore mass are conserved in a chemical reaction. So we've got the idea of developing molecular models to support an explanation. That's part of developing and using models. We've got the idea of reactants and products, and that atoms and therefore mass are conserved in a chemical reaction. That leads to the ideas down here in the display of core ideas. And then finally, we have that atoms and mass are conserved in a chemical reaction. And that's related to this cross-cutting concept that matter is conserved because atoms are conserved in physical and chemical processes. And so each of these elements, the practices, the core ideas, the cross cutting concepts, can be found in the performance expectation. So with that little piece in place to get an idea of the standards and how they're set up, I will pass the baton off to Andy and Jennifer and have them share with you about ecosystems. Thank you, Ted. Uh, I'm Andy Anderson from Michigan State, and I'm here with my colleague Jennifer Dorothy. Hello, everyone. Uh, and the first thing we'd like to do is uh, ask ask you a question. So uh, uh, we'd we'd like to know very quickly uh, what age students you're most interested in. Uh, so would you please uh, use your buttons to uh, answer A, B, C, D, or E? Thanks, Andy and Jennifer. And I'll, I'll go ahead and just uh, jump in and remind those who may have joined a little bit late. The poll buttons are located right at the top of your participant window. You'll see under your own name um, the uh, the little button with the A on it. And then you can pick A through E to give us your best response. And I'll keep the poll open for another five seconds or so to see if we can get um, more folks in there. It looks like we've got almost everybody has responded, which is great. Thanks, everyone, for being so quick on this. And I will go ahead and lock the poll and put up our graph so everybody can take a look. And then Andy and Jennifer, I'll turn it back over to you. OK, thank you so much. So it looks like we have uh, a nice even spread across grades uh, K through 12. Uh, not very many people interested in college. If you're interested in uh, other or multiple grade levels. So uh, we'd like to talk a minute about what we're going to do today then. Uh, we have basically three topics for today's webinar. First, we're going to talk about uh, why this is a core idea. What is it that's so important about 
ecosystems interactions and energy and dynamics uh, that makes makes it uh, important for all students to to learn about. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to talk some about learning progressions, about what we're learning, about how students' ideas about ecosystems can develop. And then finally, we're going to talk about some ideas and uh, materials we have that have to do with teaching students to reason about limits and constraints in ecosystems. So first topic, why is ecosystems, energy, and dynamics a core idea? So here's what the next generation science standards have to say about that. Uh, that they have two, the two big ideas here. Uh, one is uh, that uh, we want to help students formulate an answer to the question, how and why do organisms interact with their environment? What are the effects of these interactions? And the disciplinary core idea is split into four sub-ideas, sub uh, one having to do with interdisciplinary relationships within, with ecosystems, uh, cycles of matter and energy transfer, ecosystems, dynamics, functioning, and resilience, and social interactions and group behavior. We're going to focus today mostly on the first three of those four. And we're going to talk about them in terms of the next slide, in terms of two main strands. Uh, one of those main strands is uh, community ecology, has seemed having to do with understanding relationships among populations and ecosystems, and the other having to do with ecosystem science or tracing matter and energy through ecosystems. Uh, so Jennifer is going to talk mostly about community ecology. I'm going to talk mostly about uh, ecosystem science. And Jennifer, why don't you uh, take over to say a little bit about community ecology at this point? Sure. And so um, just wanted to give kind of a, a sample um, performance expectation uh, in the community ecology area of, of NGSS. And that is, so we would ask students to construct an explanation that predicts the patterns of interactions among organisms across multiple ecosystems. And so what we're talking about here is, you know, the kind of interactions that organisms, um, kind of classes are like, that the students can predict what kind of predator-prey interactions would happen, or what kind of organisms would compete against each other. So that's what we mean by understanding the relationships among populations in ecosystems. But then also the, how the populations interact with each other, and then their environment around them, the abiotic environment. Okay, so some key points about community ecology that students need um, to, to learn dur during um, school is that students need to be able to connect different scales or levels of organization. So we all know that, you know, you can kind of, biology is this hierarchy of scales, right? We can look at uh, molecules and we look at cells and then tissues and organ systems and individuals, populations, communities, and ecosystems. And community ecology is really talking about how um, connecting what's going on with individual organisms to their populations, and then how those populations interact in communities, and then how those communities interact with their environment for ecosystems. So students need to be able to reason across these different scales. And you know, included in that is students need to be able to connect the, what's happening in the biotic communities to what's happening with the abiotic environment. That you know, the amount of soil nutrients really impacts how the different plant species are competing against one another, for example. And one other point about community ecology is this is uh, very closely connected to the evolutionary disciplinary core idea, that um, core idea four. It's, it's LS4, um, look, except, so LS4 is looking at the changes in size and genetic composition of populations, and community ecology is looking at, also looking at the changes in size, um, but, but more of their function and their interactions with each other and the environment instead of the changes in genetic composition. Okay, so um, let's try out a, a question about community ecology and that we might ask students to do. So if you could answer this question using your little poll um, device up there. So this is about deer and wolves in an uh, in island in Lake Superior. Just take a minute and read this to yourself and answer the question. Yeah. It's a long question, so we'll wait just a little yeah. bit longer than usual.
All right, thanks, everybody. It looks like we've got okay. almost everybody up there, so why don't we go ahead and uh, take a look. I'll, um, Andy, Jennifer, do you want the uh, responses published to this slide right now? All right, here we yes, go. Please. Here's what everybody thought, and I'll move it down here so we can all still see the answers while we discuss. All right, great. And so it looks like we have a real split between uh, answer B and answer D. And so... And E, none of the above, a fair number. So no, 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 not E. People just didn't... Play. Oh, no, people didn't. Never mind. Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, the correct answer is actually B. There will always be more deer than wolves. So even though the populations fluctuate, there's always on average going to be more deer than wolves in the population. And so that's because there will, the deer, right, are the, in a, on a lower trophic level, and we'll, we'll talk about this in just a second, but so the, the, the as uh, the deer in, are in the lower trophic level, and there's the wolves on top of that, as um, matter and energy move up the trophic pyramid, there's a, a loss of um, some of that energy as, as heat, uh, as the, the wolves are, you know, the spy and some of the deers are dying without getting eaten by wolves, so they're, they're um, decomposing. And then there's also some of the matter that are, that's in the deer can't make baby wolves because it's being respired and breathed out by the deer's CO2. Yeah, so I, I think uh, something that you're probably, many of you are probably thinking about now is you've seen that graph that shows the lengths in the hair and seems to show how sometimes there's more lengths and sometimes there mo there's more hair and so forth. That graph, when, when people show that graph, they, you rarely notice that the scales for the lengths in the hairs are different, that they're showing two different scales at the same time. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting how, how common this, the answer D is among people who, in other contexts, uh, do think about trophic levels in a different way. Right. Yeah, and so I wanted to, I was going to draw a little graph, but I now see that I chose yellow, which you can't really see, maybe. But I wanted to show that, yeah, so what happens is that the, yeah, that we're always seeing that in the textbook, that, you know, that when, when the predator goes up, the amount of prey go down, but, or, or vice versa, but what happens is they just drew the graph too close together and used two different axes. And so take a look at your textbook maybe tonight when you go home or tomorrow when you go back into school, and you'll see how it's very misleading for the students to, you know, when we use that. And so, as, and you can see here that some of the students, though, they're, they are really split between C and D. So here's um, a graph we have that we've collected some data, what middle and high school students have to say about this same deer wolf question uh, across the country. And, you know, in general, they think that there will, um, and this is before instruction, so this is as they enter your middle school and high school classrooms, um, that there will be more wolves than deer. And um, we'll talk in a minute why they think that, but in general, they think, well, wolves eat deer, so there must be more wolves than deer, because after a one-on-one -on -one encounter between a wolf and a deer, there's more wolf than there's deer, because the deer is dead and the wolf ate it. Um, but then also, like, um, like we saw here tonight, a lot of them have seen that graph, and they know that sometimes the populations go up and sometimes the populations go down. And so here, we always ask the students to explain, you know, choose what the best multiple choice answer and then explain your, explain the results. And so here are three representative, kind of the three different levels that we see the students answer. And you see this top, this top answer right here is very, very rare. And so only maybe five or ten percent of the students answer it this way, that the deer are on a lower trophic level, so there must be more deer to convert plants into them so the wolves can eat them. The wolves only get a fraction of the energy from the deer, so there must be more deers. And so I think that's a really good um, explanation by a student who's really reasoning about these populations, about the deer being a population at a lower trophic level and the wolves being a population at a higher trophic level and about the energy moving, you know, from one population to the other. So here are, at the bottom here, are two much more common types of answers. So the middle answer, the populations would balance because one grows, the other declines, and then it reverses, kind of like an interpretation of that graph that, you know, as predators go up, the prey go down, and vice versa. 
And then, um, which is true, but not is, on the same scale. Right, right, which is true, but not in sheer numbers, right? The deer population does increase when there are less wolves, but there's just so many more deer than there are wolves at any time. And then this third answer is very common in, in, in younger students that I don't think there be more wolves because deer don't eat wolves, wolves eat deer. And so kind of focusing on this individual interactions between the wolf and the deer instead of the whole population. Okay, so what's important here in this type of question? That students need to think about populations and not just individuals. So when they're looking at ecosystems, it's important to consider the whole population and not just individual interactions. And so they need to consider relationships among populations so as predator-prey or competition, but in, in not just the individuals, but, but thinking about what the effects are as a whole. And then in, um, they also need to consider how these different populations contribute to the overall ecosystem structure and function, like thinking about different trophic levels. You know, the deer and the wolves are on different trophic levels, and so that kind of explains uh, the size of each trophic level. And this is um, important when you're looking at those biomass pyramids or those trophic pyramids, and we're going to talk about that a little later. And so um, this is just an example of the um, kind of the population interactions for the community ecology. We didn't talk about how the abiotic and biotic environments interact yet, but we'll talk about that a little later. So let's switch over for a minute to ecosystem science, to tracing matter and energy. And an, exa uh, an example of that uh, is the idea that students should develop a model to describe the movement of matter among plants, animals, decomposers, and the environment. So what does that mean? Uh, so here, here are some key points that we think about when we're thinking about ecosystem science, about students talking about matter and energy in ecosystems. Uh, one is that, that this, this idea depends very much on a key cross-cutting concept. The cross-cutting concept of energy and matter, flow cycle, and conservation uh, says that because energy and matter are conserved, that means it's possible to trace them through all kinds of systems, from atomic molecular scale all the way up to the ecosystem scale and the global scale. And that's, that's critically important. The other key idea that we focus on is the idea that students need to be able to make connections among those scales, that are, there are processes going on at the cellular scale and the atomic molecular scale, such as photosynthesis and cellular respiration and biosynthesis. And those are related to visible processes at the organismal scale, such as eating and breathing and growth and digestion. And those, in turn, are related to uh, matter cycling and energy flow at the ecosystem scale. So uh, in, the, in the course of their K-12 education, uh, these, this ability to trace matter and energy and the ability to switch back and forth from larger and smaller scales are two key practices that we hope students will be able to develop. So here's a quick uh, 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 diagram that summarizes the key ideas. Matter cycles, energy flows. I remember having a, a professor uh, in college who said uh, he was teaching an ecology course, and I remember him saying, if you only remember one thing from this course, this is it. Remember, matter cycles, energy flows. So that's represented on the diagram here with the energy being in red and the matter being in green. So the energy goes from sunlight to chemical energy in uh, biomass and ultimately to uh, heat and work. At the same time, uh, matter, you'll notice, is moving into and out of the atmosphere. The carbon cycle, the most basic of all the cycles, moves from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and into biomass and then back to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So now I've got another, we've got another question for you uh, that has to do with the biomass pyramid. Uh, now this, you'll notice this is related to the deer wolves question. That This is uh, saying that if you've got this island in Lake Superior, there's going to be a whole lot of plants. And in general, the mass of the deer, uh, the herbivores in general, is, is going to be about a tenth of the mass of the plants. And the mass of the wolves or the carnivores in general is going to be about a tenth of the mass of the herbivores. So our question uh, is, why is this? What is it? And this is a question about connecting scales. 
what is it about deer and wolves and plants that makes that uh, that the pattern appear over and over in ecosystems all around the world. And we recognize there are some aquatic ecosystems and so forth where that's different, but in terrestrial ecosystems all over the world you see a pattern like this. What makes for that pattern? So this is an open response question. Uh, we'd like to invite you to, uh, to type your responses into the chat uh, and share them that way. So folks, just continue to write down your answer to Andy's question here in the in the chat area. We've got some folks who are have put down some different pieces here. Eric has noted students need to discover it for themselves. Um, uh, plants are the primary source of energy in all ecosystems. Plants are the base because they make their own food using energy from the sun. Over the lifetime of organisms, it expends energy on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. It needs food lower on the food chain to maintain its energy needs, lower level on the chain, um, limited occupation of space, much energy is lost to each level getting the food, eating it, digesting it, and using it to perform bodily functions, etc. Great. Thanks, Ted. So, uh, let's take a look at how middle and high school students tend to answer this question. Um, so again, we we are these are in order from answers that we consider the best uh, to answers that and, and are, are relatively rare to answers that are much more common among the students. So uh, the only 10% of the energy in the previous level is passed on to the next level. Uh, that's essentially the pattern that we're talking about. And then this next sentence uh, is a, a rare sort of sentence. You'll notice that what the student is doing in this next sentence is relating the uh, organismal scale to the ecosystem scale, saying that in an organ, uh, in an organism, the uh, most of the energy goes to cellular respiration and the cost of living. Only a small amount is available for the next trophic level. Uh, more common kinds of answers. Every time a living thing eats something, it's only getting 10% of the energy. Uh, you know, that's not, that's not actually true. The, the, the food has got 100% of the energy, but only 10% of the energy ends up being available for the next trophic level. Uh, as the food chain progresses, there's less food available for the next trophic level, so they must have less biomass. True, but not, a, not an explanation. And finally, there are a lot of people and animals that are resorting, resorting to eating plants. There's uh, a, a large number of uh, students that explain, again, by sort of going back to the individual scale and not thinking about relationships among populations or trophic levels. Yeah, they just talk about, well, there's a food chain and this is how it works. Yeah. <laughs> so what's important here? Uh, we think one important thing is that uh, this idea of being able to connect matter and energy, to trace matter and energy at multiple scales, including both the organism and the ecosystem scale. Uh, if you, in doing that, you have to think about, so when an individual consumer eats food, what's going to happen to that food? That it really gets split up three ways. Uh, some of it goes straight through and is never absorbed by the uh, body of the, of the organism. Uh, and ends up in the soil as feces. Uh, some of it is going to be used for cellular respiration. Uh, and when it's used for cellular respiration, the carbon returns to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. And some of it, typically around 10% or so, is used to, uh, for biosynthesis, but is the actual growth of the animal. And of course, only that third bullet, only the food used for growth, is going to be available at the next trophic level. So why do we care about ecosystems? Why, why is this um, a core idea in, in NGSS? And I think we can answer that question in, in two different ways. So one, our lives and our economy depend on the services that ecosystems provide. So oh, there we go. So 
you know, for example, now we're, we this is I think one of these new new or uh, more more prominently placed uh, parts in NGSS as compared to other standards. But we want students to be able to understand that um, ecosystems provide ecosystem services that we as humans depend upon. So for example, one of the middle school performance expectations is evaluate competing design solutions for maintaining biodiversity in ecosystem services. And what do we mean by ecosystem services? Well, the diversity of life on our planet right now, the communities and ecosystems on our planet provide us with food on farms or you know in natural caught um, fishing and heart, uh, and foods and farms and forests that we we tend. Um, it, they provide us with our clothing, our shelter, and our medicines. Um, Another thing that we uh, want need to think about in community ecology is that the biodiversity in the genetic diversity of the native populations uh, around the planet provide resilience for that ecosystem in the face of new threats, either you know new disturbances from disease in that population, from pests that might enter that population, or from environmental changes that might come along with global warming or humans uh, changing their habitat in some other way. And so if you think about uh, matter and energy ecosystem services, you know, and think of the ecosystem as a whole and how the, you know, the Earth provides all our food, but also virtually all our fresh water needs to be cycled through our, our ecosystems and filtered through our ecosystems. The oxygen that we breathe, our clothing and shelter, again, these are all ecosystem services that, um, that the ecosystems provide. And so if we want students to be able to, if we, say that, that a basic challenge for science education in our democratic country is preparing citizens to make informed decisions about the environment, then we want to be, prepare students to understand the science that's going on in our discussions about what to do um, in both private roles as a learner or a consumer in the grocery store or in the, in the, in the Walmart, and but also public roles um, when they vote, when they advocate for different, um, different uh, policies. So another reason, besides ecosystem services, and this is related to ecosystem services, but that for students to understand that there are important limits or constraints to ecosystems when they respond to disturbances. And so if we want to maintain our ecosystem services, we have to understand that there are limits and constraints to how ecosystems can respond to the things that we're throwing at them with either climate change or habitat destruction or fracking, what have you. Um, so and you look at the performance expectations for high school this now, uh, we want students to be able to, for example, evaluate claims, evidence, and reasoning that the complex interactions in an ecosystem maintain relatively consistent numbers and types of organisms in stable conditions, but changing conditions may result in a new ecosystem. So the ecosystem um, may change, and that ecosystem may provide more or less of the ecosystem services that we are relying upon. And so students have to understand the kind of the limits and constraints to when that change might occur. A couple of different types of disturbances that um, that you might want to look at um, for students who need to understand when they're thinking about community ecology is that there are pulse disturbances, and these are things that happen um, like all at, all at once, like a flood or a fire or kind of pesticides, right? That we 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 throw the pesticides on the on the field or in the in the forest, and then that's that's one that's one pulse, and th these will affect a small number of species. And they will spread that effect, though, to other species through the abiotic and biotic relationships in that ecosystem. But then there are more press disturbances, right? Like an invasive species that's coming in, but it's going to be around a while, and it's going to change. It's going to fu maybe fundamentally alter the, the ecosystem structure, depending on the factors, such as biodiversity, in the ecosystem. So we've got one more question here that's an example, an interesting example of both ecosystem services and the press disturbance. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with this. This is uh, known, commonly known as the Keeling curve. Uh, it's the graph of carbon dioxide concentration over the last 50 years plus uh, taken at Mauna Loa, Hawaii. Uh, and it's been the, those, the sampling is done there because it's far away from local sources of carbon dioxide. So this is tracing changes in carbon dioxide uh, on a hemispheric and global scale. And you'll notice that there's two big patterns here. One is a steady upward trend, and the other is an annual cycle. But every year, the, the level of carbon di concentration of carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere goes up during the winter and then drops during the summer. 
So uh, we want to ask a question that focuses on that second pattern, on the annual cycle. So why do you think carbon dioxide concentration goes down in the summer and goes up in the winter? The most important contributor to that is uh, humans burning coal and gasoline, changes in plant growth, nuclear power plant, or changes in wind and weather. So this is, uh, would you take a minute to use your uh, multiple choice tool to choose the, your answer there? I think we're okay. Hit us summer where? <laughs> yes, yeah, summer in the northern hemisphere. Right. Is the pattern. Uh, with uh, Mauna Loa also being in the northern hemisphere. Right. Yes. 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 Summer, summer where Mauna Loa is. Thanks for that clarification, Andy and Jennifer. And it looks like we've got almost everybody has put in their answer. Folks, we'll okay. give you another five seconds or so. To, uh, to answer on the multiple choice poll button. And I will go ahead and lock it now so we can take a look at all of the responses. And we'll move it over here so we can still see all of our choices. And I will turn it back over to you, Andy and Jennifer. So the overwhelming majority of you chose B, changes in plant growth, which is, in fact, the correct answer. Uh, but is uh, is not the answer that students give most commonly. So here you can see the uh, the answer the answers that students give, and you'll see that the majority of students, uh, or close to a majority, a large plurality of students <laughs> choose A, uh, humans burning coal and gasoline, rather than changes in plant growth, uh, and uh, that's that's true. Uh, you know, that, that we have two separate questions, one focusing on the long-term trend and the other on the cycle. And choose, students choose uh, humans burning coal and gasoline for both of those. Yep. So let's look at some of the things that students have to say. So again, the top answer is relatively rare, but is a, a, a very carefully constructed explanation. Uh, during the summer, deciduous plants reduce carbon dioxide levels slightly by synthesizing CO2 and water into glucose. When these plants lose their leaves, they're no longer able to trap atmospheric carbon dioxide, and the levels no longer decrease. Uh, a, uh, uh, the, the second and third are more common sorts of answers. Uh, the second one focus, does, in fact, focus on uh, human activities. Atmospheric carbon dioxide decreases every summer because peop less people are burning coal and gasoline for warmth. Since more people are using indoor and outdoor heating in the winter, carbon dioxide at, uh, levels increase. Um, notice that uh, this, this could have some effect on how fast carbon dioxide increases in the, in the winter, but it could never explain the decrease in the summer. Uh, and then uh, there are also quite a few students who have answers like, uh, because people won't want to keep warm in the winter and not many keep, uh, people use heat in the summer. So uh, what's important here? Uh, I think that uh, if you think about Keeling curve as a seasonal, in the seasonal cycle, it's a really interesting example of ecosystem services. It's saying every summer, uh, plants sequester carbon and produce uh, oxygen. And it's because of that that we continue to be able to breathe. And we are dependent on plants doing that every summer. Um, and uh, in, in terms of uh, disturbances, the Keeling curve is uh, a prominent example of what we would call a, a long-term press disturbance uh, that the uh, not only the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but as you know, the climate is changing because of those levels of carbon dioxide. And so there are long-term changes that are happening to, happening to the environment. And we don't understand fully uh, how those changing CO2 concentrations and resulting climate change 
are going to be uh, affecting the ecosystems around us, and that becomes uh, a, uh, a key question and something that we need students to understand how important this question is. So we have completed the first segment of our presentation. Uh, and so we're going to pause now for questions and discussions. We will have people uh, putting up questions or making comments on the chat. Uh, and Ted is going to synthesize and uh, synthesize those and pose some of those questions for us. Yes, so if you've got questions, please go ahead and post them, post them here. I'm going to start off with a question that came to me as I was listening to, to, your, to your, your pieces here. When you look at the traffic levels and the 10% going to um, as you shifted between different trophic levels, there's a, obviously a certain amount of energy that's used in just sustaining an organism. And so a wolf that eats a deer that's one year old versus a, eating a deer that's 10, year old, 10 years old, there's more energy that went into the 10 year old deer than into the, the one year old deer. And does that sort of work out just in averaging over populations, how what you've, the sort of statistics that you used, or is it, or? Right, so the 10% rule is a kind of a general rule of thumb, <laughs> but for any given um, kind of collection of species, and like you say, different kind of complex intergenerational um, models, there, there, there is some, you know, difference. It could be a 20% rule or 15% rule for one trophic level and 30% for the next in a given environment. Another key idea is that, that the actual biomass depends on residence time as well as production at each level. Uh, so there are some uh, aquatic ecosystems where uh, there's, there's a much more production by producers, uh, you know, in other words, there's more biosynthesis being done by producers than by the higher trophic levels. But the carbon doesn't stay there very long. If these are little phytoplankton and they get gobbled up right away. And some of the consumers that gobble them up or the consumers of the consumers are long-lived fish. And so it's possible for there to be more biomass at the higher trophic levels, even though there's more production at the lower trophic levels. So that 10% rule is a, is a really rough kind of estimate that uh, tends to be uh, duplicated when the residence times at the different trophic levels are similar. Great. Thanks. Um, so we had one person uh, question that's posed here. It, it, I mean, you've given us all, and especially in a room like this, multiple choice questions to choose from possible explanations. Um, some curiosity here on RJ's part, maybe I think maybe someone else has said it as well. If you don't give students choices, but you just ask them to you know, give it an open response sort of answer to some of these questions. What sort of responses do they tend to give? Is it similar to what you've got there, or is it something, something different? Right. So the biomass, for example, that biomass pyramid that we we haven't asked that with multiple choice yet. So those are those are really their answers that they, that they give. You know, about food chains and then about the 10% rule. Um, and when we've asked the Keeling curve questions without choices, that yeah. So the fact that humans are burning coal in the winter time to keep warm and then they don't do that in the summer are very common even without. Yeah, in general, the choices on the multiple choice uh, are uh, originated in students' responses to the open response. That a lot of these questions that we've developed, we, we asked the open response version first and saw what students had to say and then we, asked, we, we added the multiple choice in front of it. Great. And then some people were asking a couple sort of related questions at, um, you know, the aspect, I think two things, the relationship between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere in terms of plant life that's done, and also um, photosynthesis in o from ocean dwelling organisms versus land dwelling organisms, and because the northern hemisphere obviously having more land mass might be a driver. So I don't know if you want to provide, shed some more light, no pun intended, on that subject. Yeah, I think the uh, the the land dwelling organisms, land dwelling plants, are more uh, uh, sensitive to the seasons than ocean dwelling plants. So a lot of variability. Uh, the ocean dwelling plants tend to be more stable from one season to the next. Uh, and and I think also that uh, overall. 
uh, primary production of land plants is greater than primary production of ocean plants. Well, I don't know about that. Yeah, I'm not sure about that either. Yeah, I don't think so. But 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 for sure, they um the the oceans, they, even if they're doing a massive amount of photosynthesis, it's steady throughout the year, and so the changes in the photosynthesis um, rates on on land are yeah, you can see definitely the change. And you can see um, if you look in the southern hemisphere, where they have some observatories in the southern hemisphere, the this it's still the same pattern, you know, flipped, but uh, depressed. They there it's um. This is that there's less plants in the southern hemisphere, so there's a less of a, a, a big distinction to go up and down. Great. Well, I, I see there's a response to the lynx hair one. Uh, that, that there's actually this other interesting twist on the particularly the lynx hair data, that the data are uh, they come from the Hudson's Bay Company and they come from the number of, of pelts that trappers sold. And, and so oh. I think there's also a sampling bias that uh, the lynx pelts are more uh, valuable than the hair pills. And so the, the links are being oversampled in the, uh, in the trap pills. And as a result of that, sometimes there actually are more lynx pills turned in the hair pills. Very interesting and just in terms of, you know, where we go and look for data and how that, you know, how, you know, biases in data collection, an interesting piece to sort of think about in, in, in all of this, in all of this work. Thanks. That's an, that's an interesting piece to look at. So I'm not seeing any more graphs, so I would suggest we go on to the next piece and people can continue to post. Feel free at any point to post any questions you have and we'll go, go through it. Thanks. Okay, so the next segment has to do with learning progressions and what we're learning about how students' ideas about ecosystems can develop. And so you, we've already given you some foreshadowing of that. In, the t in terms of the kinds of responses that we see from middle and high school students. We'd like to take a minute now to say, uh, what, what, ha what can we learn if we try to be more systematic in thinking about uh, how students can, uh, can develop an understanding of these complex knowledge and practices that we're talking about? And so this is uh, sort of the, the idea here is to focus on uh, the development of students' ideas and the, the kind of research that we do in doing that is learning progressions research. And a learning progression typically includes uh, three parts. Uh, it includes what we call a learning progression framework, uh, which describes levels of achievement in students. Uh, it includes assessment tools that reveal students' reasoning. You've already seen some of those. Uh, and it includes teaching tools and strategies. Uh, so you've, uh, the, we're going to talk now some about the learning progression framework. So in a learning progression framework, what is it that progresses? Uh, we think of three different things as progressing, meaning that these are things that change over time as students master the knowledge and practices associated with uh, this disciplinary core idea. One is discourse. It's how we use language to describe and explain the world. A second is practices, as in the scientific practices, uh, and their precursors among younger students. And the third is knowledge, uh, the precursors and the actual versions of cross-cutting concepts and disciplinary core ideas. So I think knowledge and practices will be familiar to you. Let me take one slide to talk about discourse. Um, Everybody, every student comes in to school already a master of language. That they've got a vocabulary of tens of thousands of words, uh, and they uh, and they have learned to speak those in grammatical ways. And in the process of learning that language, uh, that language has embedded in it a theory of the world and how it works. Uh, and it's sometimes that theory is quite different from the theory that's embedded in scientific language. So learning science, and in some ways, is like learning a second language, uh, except for one big difference, that oftentimes science and the second language are using the same words in different ways. So these words like energy and matter and weight and material and so forth are words that are used both in science and in everyday uh, discourse with different meanings and sorting out the meanings that kids have compared to the meanings that uh, adults have or scientists have is, is one of the core problems that we have to think about as we work on developing learning progressions. Oops. So we're going we're gonna to take uh, 
a, a disturbance scenario as an example. This is, a, this is actually a scenario that Jennifer has been giving interviews about. And so, Jennifer, I'm going to turn that over to you. All right, great. So we have asked students, um, we've asked them to talk about the, the Florida Everglades. And we've asked students, uh, we've talked to students in Michigan and Baltimore and Colorado and Santa Barbara about this. Uh, we haven't actually talked to any students in Florida, so that might be different. But um, we, we chose a, a system, kind of a, a complex system for them to start thinking about. And so uh, if we look at, say, the, our focus population being these rabbits in the Everglades. So the population of rabbits, and this is a marsh rabbit, in the Everglades has, has really decreased. It's really plunged after an invasion of the Burmese python. And here's the python. And so what is happening in this? We ask them, what is happening in this ecosystem? And how might this decrease in rabbits affect the alligator, but also affect the plants and, uh, and the microbes in, in, the, uh, in the ecosystem? And so we're going to talk to you a little bit about how elementary school students and then middle and high school students kind of think about this, this scenario and, and what they're telling us. Okay. So typical elementary student accounts of pythons in the Everglades. They're using their everyday discourse, their, their, their English language or their, their first language. And for them, this is a story about individual actors. There are pythons and alligators and rabbits, and they all have needs and they have purposes. So for example, the plant is there, the cattails are there for the rabbit to eat. Okay, and it, So they're there, the rabbit eats it, and then the rabbit can and have babies and live its life. But the plant also has a purpose. The, plant's purpose is to grow. And if it gets its water and its sunlight, then it can grow. But the plant doesn't necessarily um, interact with this environment. It doesn't, it doesn't decrease the amount of nutrients that are in the soil or anything like that. As long as the plant you know, has light and water, it's going to grow and, and fulfill its purpose in life. If you look at how students think about the rabbit, the rabbit has needs the grass to grow, but the matter in the grass doesn't become matter in the rabbit. So the student isn't thinking about this system of carbon dioxide and water and glucose that the plant is making that might go into the rabbit in digestion. The student is thinking that if the rabbit can eat the grass, then it's going to be able to live and grow and have babies and be happy. It might, of course, then get eaten by an alligator. <laughs> But um, that's kind of the role of the alligator, which is to, to eat the rabbit and be enemies with the rabbit. Um, and then the python and the alligator will duke it out for the rabbits. And so the reason that the rabbits, um, the rabbits are plunging in, in the, um, the Everglades because the pythons are eating them or scaring them. But, and so that, that's actually you know, what's happening is that the pythons are eating the rabbits. But that's not um, the, the reason that the pythons are eating the rabbits. Uh, isn't as clear to elementary students. Um, when, when the students are talking to us about what's happening, about the pythons and the alligators and the rabbits interacting, they often use human analogies. So they'll say that the um, animals want or like uh, to do things. So for example, we ask the students, um, you know, when the pythons uh, invaded, so we tell them how the pythons invaded the Everglades, that people let their pets go in the Everglades. That's what happened. And um, so what, why are the pythons growing so quickly? How come the population is growing so quickly? And they say, well, the pythons are going to grow and grow and grow, and they're going to try to be comfortable. And once they reach a comfortable amount of pythons, they'll stop growing, and that'll be how many pythons there are. And so they don't really talk about you know, they're not really considering um, the constraints on the python population or, you know, in, you know, in Burma or in the Everglades. So one, one thing that's kind of striking about this is the degree of which uh, most students' understanding of ecosystems kind of seem to come, seems to come more from media than it comes from uh, any kind of contact with ecosystems themselves. So you can think about this as sort of a progression from the Lion King to March of the Penguins. <laughs> that the Lion King, uh, you know, is basically a story about humans in animal costumes that, that you know, it's all about uh, uh, animals that uh, have human emotions and relationships. March of the Penguins is somewhat more realistic, uh, but still is uh, built around uh, the, the heroic attempts of the penguins to love and raise their children. And individuals. Yes, as individuals. And so that, that being the case, uh, what is it, tell, tell us about what 
we'd like kids what, to learn. What would we like them yeah. to know? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, this is a, these are um, kind of responses of the typical elementary student, not the student who hopefully is leaving our fifth grade classroom. Students leaving our fifth grade classrooms, we want them to, so some important things about community ecology is, we want them to know that all ecosystems have, even the yard outside their school, have many different types of organisms, even organisms they can't see. There are microbes, there are decomposers, there are things in the soil like earthworms and protists and many different organisms. And so we want them to become familiar with all these different types of organisms, not these big charismatic ones, just like alligators and pythons and rabbits. We want them, a very important point is for them to understand that different organisms have different life cycles. So every, all life cycles aren't like the human life cycle. We all don't, all organisms don't have one or two children and then they don't take care of those children until they become adults and then we don't hopefully live for a long time. Um, different organisms have, for example, many, many babies and a lot of those babies die before reaching adulthood. This really important thing we'd like uh, elementary students to learn is that not all organisms can be reasoned with analogy to humans. And in addition, we want students to understand that the physical characteristics of an environment affect the organisms that live there and are not just scenery that these kind of, that they're uh, playing a, a little play on. Yeah. yeah, so so then thinking about matter and energy. Uh, what, what might students learn about matter and energy in ecosystems? Uh, we think with respect to matter uh, that students at this point are still in the process of figuring out what matter is and in particular figuring out that gases are matter like solids and liquids uh, and that those in turn are different from things like heat and light and temperature. Uh, they're learning how to measure the amount of mass using weight or mass and volume and dis distinguishing that from density. Uh, they're learning about tracing matter through animal bodies, the processes like digestion and matter traveling through the bloods of the rest of the body and being used for growth and energy. Uh, when, we, when we look at elementary school students uh, reasoning about food chains, we see that they can do a pretty good job of tracing cause and effect, uh, but tracing, actually tracing matter through all of the uh, chemical changes that it goes through as it moves through a food chain is very difficult for, for young children. And energy, uh, it's, it's no problem to get students to say that energy is being passed from one organism to another, but what they mean by energy and what adults mean by energy is so different that we really question how meaningful that is. So let's move on to middle and high school and then after that we'll pause for questions and discussion. So at the middle and high school level, uh, what, what do we see typical students doing when they're accounting for pythons in the Evergrades? Uh, we see that middle and high school students have learned lots of facts that elementary school students don't know. Uh, they can talk about different scales. Uh, they, they mention names of substances and names of atoms and molecules. Uh, they still tend to reason about individuals interacting rather than populations changing. Uh, they focus almost exclusively on predator-prey relationships or on direct competition. Uh, rather than on other kinds of relationships. Uh, and uh, they uh, think of the physical environment affecting organisms, but much less about the organisms affecting the physical environment. Uh, and so they do think about large-scale connections among food chains as flows of matter and energy, but they tend to think in terms of separate nutrient and uh, O2, uh, CO2 cycles. So let's look at that. So this is the account of matter cycling and energy flow that we tend to get from uh, middle and high school students. One thing you'll notice is that when, when they talk about it, both matter and energy tend to cycle. Uh, so if you ask middle school and high school students where plants get their energy, the first thing they'll say is sunlight, but then you say, well, what about minerals in the soil? They'll say, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Minerals in the soil, that's a source of energy for plants too. And if you ask about water, oh, well, that's a source of energy for plants too. So they tend to think of both matter and energy cycling from plants to animals and through decay being recycled through the soil. And they think of that as happening separately from the oxygen carbon dioxide cycle uh, where uh, plants turn oxygen into car carbon dioxide into oxygen uh, which is mostly to help us, and then we do the opposite. Um, 
if you think about it, this for students who don't have a strong chemical understanding of what's going on, this really makes a lot of sense that, that uh, you know, one colorless, odorless gas being changed into another in the oxygen carbon dioxide cycle and solid stuff in the soil being changed to solid stuff in the plants, uh, that, that also seems a perfectly reasonable, credible thing to be happening. So when students are talking about recycling and so forth, you, you, we have to be careful in trying to understand what they mean. So next slide. Uh, so what, what would we like them to learn here? Uh, so uh, in terms of community ecology, we're hoping that they're going to learn about a broader set of eco ecosystem interactions, uh, including mutualism and indirect competition and things like that. Uh, we hope that they're going to be able to uh, relate uh, in reactions among individuals to consequences at the population scale. And we hope they're going to start understanding how the physical environment both affects organisms and is affected by organisms. Then with respect to matter and energy, uh, we hope that they can start relating uh, the visible things they see, plants and animals, uh, and invisible microorganisms to large-scale movement of matter from one pool to another, from producers to consumers to, to soil carbon to atmospheric carbon. Uh, we hope that they will start seeing matter cycling and energy flowing in a more accurate way than what we were just depicting, and relating the visible activities of organisms to large-scale fluxes of matter and energy and connecting, ultimately connecting the size of the pools to the rate, rate of the fluxes. And so that brings us back to the uh, scientific account of carbon cycling that we showed before. This is, this is the account uh, of matter uh, in the carbon cycle, matter going into and out of the atmosphere, which is built in as the high school goal for the next generation science standards. One last comment about learning progressions and scale. Uh, elementary students are going to reason mostly at the macroscopic scale, mostly about individual organisms, and uh, we think it's not likely that they're going to move beyond that very much. At middle school, we hope to see students making contact connections between macroscopic uh, scale uh, individual organisms and the smaller scales, the cellular and the atomic molecular scale, and the larger systems like ecosystems. And by high school, we're hoping students can be fluent in making connections across scale and moving from atomic molecular to the ecosystem and global scales. So this is time for our second pause for questions and discussion. I wanted to say one thing as you're maybe collecting your thoughts and, and typing them in there, the chat thing. I saw a little discussion about how animals might have um, human um, emotions and saying that all animals don't have emotions or, or take care of their offspring is, is not something we want students to you know, it may not be true. And I think um, that while that might be true, um, what I want to focus on is how students use inappropriate human analogies. So when you're talking about, let's say, spiders or bacteria, students will still use human analogies. And so maybe with wolves, there, you know, there is parental care and there are only a few offspring and, and you know, organisms live in packs and that they, maybe they mourn their young and you saw that video of the, the elephant died and they mourned, you know, it was mourned. But those are, um, you know, kind of big complex, I don't like to call them complex, but you know, they're, they're, they're big uh, animals with complex brains. But there are many, many other types of organisms like plants and bacteria and um, some invertebrates that students are still using those inappropriate analogies that we don't, um, that yeah. we feel is important that they don't. I, I remember uh, this, this nice quote from a, uh, like a sixth grader uh, answering the python question. And there's a the question that interview on something along the lines, suppose 100 pythons 100 baby baby pythons were, were brought and let go in the, in oh. the Everglades. What would happen? And the, yeah, and the, the, the suit's response is, what would they do without their mother? They were very upset. Great. So, um, again, go ahead and post some questions down in the, uh, in the chat box. And to, to start with, um, with one piece here, um, we've got some questions about in terms of your discussion of language and scientific language, and if you have any comments or perspectives to provide for students who are English language learners um, who are at that point in time acquiring their, their understanding of English at the same time they're getting their understanding of scientific English, um, how should teachers work with that situation or in what ways is that different?
uh, I think the first thing to realize is that uh, that this is really a significant problem because students are dealing with a dual language barrier. Uh, that on the one hand, they're probably learning uh, a new national language, and at the same time, they're learning a new social language or a new discourse. Uh, and so, in uh, in, in working with them, uh, it really is important to be thinking about uh, how are we, on the one hand, going to help them work, uh, learn the vocabulary of the new national language, and on the other hand, learn the, the vocabulary of the new social language. Uh, uh, certainly, one important, uh, you know, there, there are a variety of ways in which graphic organizers and other sorts of things that make relationships clear uh, are important, and I also think that uh, that. Uh, experiences where they are working directly in ecosystems and having a chance uh, to see and try to express what they're seeing and, and make sense of what they're seeing uh, can, can play a useful role. Great. There's also a discussion here that ties into this some of this question um, about anthropomorphizing. Particularly at the elementary level, you run into the, the issue of students reading, you know, books for their English language arts classes that portray animals in a sort of a non-scientific manner and whether you have any advice about, you know, wh whether that practice was good or how to deal with that practice in terms of some of the other things you're talking about here um, would be useful. <laughs> Jennifer was telling me about this yesterday for her one-year-old. Yes, he has a book, How Animal Mommies Love Their Babies. And I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> and and but, but really, there's no problem with young children thinking about how animals, mommies, animal mommies right. love their babies. That that's, that's really just fine. Uh, and, and the use of analogies with humans, uh, that, that we do it all the time, that scientists do it. Uh, and, and so uh, what students are doing as they go through school is hopefully becoming more and more sophisticated in figuring out uh, when the human analogy is appropriate and when the human analogy is not appropriate. Uh, so uh, in terms of mothers caring for their babies, it's like we know that there's, uh, you know, for a, a fair number of mammals and reptiles, uh, the, hu the analogy with human mothers caring for their babies really is appropriate. Uh, but by the time you get to uh, uh, pythons or spiders or things like that, we hope students will start to realize, no, there's really something completely different going on there. Mm -hmm. And my analogy with mothers caring to, for their babies is not going uh, right. to be so important. I think that students can, are starting to learn, right, as they get through elementary school to upper L and middle school, that you know, sometimes they're playing pretend, right? And those books are written, they're playing pretend. And being able to make that... Um, you know, notice that difference, um, I think. It sounds to me like in the same way that you wouldn't now. expect students to you. totally give up, you know, say, you know, saying, you know, I've just got no energy today doesn't mean that they are, you know, needing to consume some, some nourishment sometimes. It just means that they're tired. Right, and I think that, that Maya here in the chat has a good point, that it's, it's essentially code switching, right? Using your first discourse or your scientific discourse right. and knowing when... Fantastic. You should My last question here, again, is something that I, that I was thinking about in looking at some of your, your cycle diagrams. And you didn't talk about this explicitly, but I was curious. Do you, do you find it useful to use the idea of reservoirs and the transfer of matter and air energy between different different reservoirs, even if you don't use that specific term? Uh, yes. Uh, I sometimes we say pools and fluxes rather than reservoirs and transfer, but uh, we think that that uh, being able to to think in terms of uh, you know, there's a certain number of carbon atoms in the world, uh, or you know, in the, the, the area of the Earth's crust, and those carbon atoms got to be somewhere. Uh, and the choices we make about whether to put those carbon atoms in the atmosphere or in the soil or in uh, trees in our forests have consequences for ourselves and other people. So it really is important for students to start being able to think about. Uh, in, in the more abstract way about 
carbon pools and carbon fluxes or uh, the, the size of energy fluxes. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's one of the things we're aiming at in our uh, work with uh, teaching students. Great. So why don't we go on here things. now and we can then do some questions at the end. Right, great. Um, so the third thing we're, we're going to talk about today is uh, what can we do to teach students to reason about these limits and constraints when reasoning about ecosystems. Okay, um, so I'll start with the community ecology, and I have a, a couple things that uh, that would I want to suggest. Is one, uh, students should encounter and analyze their local biodiversity. So activities to familiarize students with the life cycles and activities of non-human organisms. So the similarities and differences, um, the similarities and differences in reproduction, in death rates, and differences in interactions, and the you know the need quote unquote for those interactions. You know, organisms are not eating, the pythons aren't eating the, the rabbits to be mean, or their organisms, um, they're eating them, you know, so that to have food, so they turn that food into their, you know, into their bodies. Um, so, you know, just familiar activities that you do right now um, in elementary school, like the tracking the lifestyle of an organism, or following, for example, a caterpillar to a butterfly, or from eggs to a caterpillar to a butterfly, those are great activities to do with students, and I think that just taking the time to emphasize the differences maybe in reproduction rate, right? Look how many eggs one butterfly has. Or, um, and look how, you know, how many of them will survive into to adulthood. And I think one thing we can also do is um, maybe not, not draw the eyes on the butterfly and the caterpillar like human eyes, you know, not emphasizing that, that they are um, kind of anthropomorphizing the, the, the the butterflies or the crickets or things like that that we're uh, using in our classrooms. And so, and this doesn't have to be butterflies that you buy from Carolina, but also just um, looking outside and counting, you know, the seeds that a plant makes and then how many new baby plants are there the next year and then how many of them grow up into adulthood and look at how many, um, you know, in the local field or something like that. Uh, another thing is um, with encountering and analyzing biodiversity, is activities that familiarize the students with their local biodiversity at all scales. So collecting, observing, and analyzing just the diversity around them, um, getting microscopes out and looking in the soil, looking in pond scum, things that we're already doing and emphasizing the, the biodiversity. And, 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 and in addition, in, in, in a couple different ways. So one way that we've done is we give students, um, we have students collect organisms from a local stream, so local invertebrates that many of you may have done. And also we have them collect um, the microscopic things. And so here you maybe you can't tell, but this is kind of like a sieve. And this is a bunch of leaves. And there's a bunch of um, invertebrates in those leaves that the students pick through. And they identify them. And we can have them um, use kind of a, a tree of life and draw the, draw the organisms on little cards and sort them and see, oh, what kind of organisms are in this pond? You know, there's, there's invertebrates, but there's also some leaves. So there's some plants. And maybe there's some fungi or spiders. And there's also. Uh, frogs in the pond, and then we have them look under the microscope, and they can see protists, and maybe they can even see bacteria, depending on you know, your microscope, or maybe you show a little video of things that uh, they can't see. But in addition to this kind of phylogenetic analysis, we can have them then uh, analyze what kind of trophic levels they are, and so we have we can give them a little reading of of you know what organisms that live in the stream eat, and they can kind of make a food web based on what organisms they found. Or we can also, we, you can give them information about, for example, the dissolved oxygen content that each of these different types of organisms requires. And so they can see that different abiotic environments can also play a role in, um, in what biodiversity that they might find in their stream. And um, another thing they can uh, you know, also collect and analyze abiotic factors about the environment, bringing in the fact that the physical environment is part of the system and that they always need to be thinking about the biotic and abiotic environments. And we have a um, activity that that many of you may be familiar with, but uh, let's see, this, oh, hmm, I, I don't know what to do now. Okay, well, you can kind of see. So if you go to the www.pathwaysproject.kbs.msu.edu, you see our version of this leaf Pack um, experiment is there, and I put it in the chat so you can see it too. And then uh, the final activity I want to suggest is to really um, make visible for students how 
their organism, uh, interactions between organisms and the abiotic environment. And so organisms, I mean, students will often talk about organisms having interactions with each other, but they, they don't generally think about the indirect interactions, like one organism may interact with another through changing the abiotic environment. And so you can, um, we have these graphic organizers in the curriculum that I just um, shared, and we have them say, okay, well, what will happen if there's a disturbance, say, for a loss of scrapers in the stream? So a scraper eats, let's say, algae off a rock. What would happen? Well, would there, would, uh, if there are less scrapers there, would it decrease the available oxygen when it kill, uh, would decrease the available oxygen in the stream by killing the algae? Or sorry, not loss of, I guess, gain of scrapers. Um, and then what would happen? The organisms that live in the stream that need a higher amount of oxygen would move or die, and then what would happen? And so you can challenge students to look for the mechanism of all these, how these organisms are related to each other, and then, so that students aren't just thinking in a linear way, you can kind of step back and have a larger class discussion and draw a really big kind of interaction web on, on the board of what are all the different ways a loss of or gain of scrapers might change the, the interactions in this ecosystem. So thinking about matter and energy, uh, we're currently working on a, a set of six units that are going to be available next year on the National Geographic website. Uh, and uh, one of those six units is a unit on ecosystems and ecosystem interactions. Uh, and that, that uh, set of, uh, that, that unit is designed to last two or three weeks, and so there's lots of stuff in it. And I'll just very briefly talk about three things that are there. The three questions, simulations, and animations. So three questions. Uh, this is uh, something that we're, we're using to say, if you want to understand what's going on with matter and energy and ecosystems, there are really these three questions that you always have to answer. The carbon pools question saying, where is carbon? Uh, the carbon fluxes question saying, where is it moving? How is it being changed chemically or moving from one place to another? And the energy question saying, how does energy flow through these ecosystems? And associated with each question, you'll notice there are particular rules to, to follow that have to do with conservation of matter and energy. Uh, and there are uh, uh, things about connecting atoms to evidence means how do you, what is it that you can notice in the world around you that's connected with the answers to these three questions? So simulations. Uh, uh, one of the, the simulations we have is the carbon dice game, where there's a set of stations around the room and students roll dice to go. Uh, students play carbon atoms and they roll dice to go from one station to another. So this is sort of a typical station that there's the producer station. Uh, and so when a carbon atom goes through photosynthesis and ends up in the producer station, uh, the students roll their dice and say, well, one, one thing that could happen is that the plant could use you for cellular respiration. You're going to go back to the atmosphere. Or another thing that could happen is the plant could use you uh, for growth, could make you part of its uh, wood or its leaves or something like that. And if you're part of growth, then uh, maybe you're going to die and go back to the soil. Or maybe you're going to get eaten by a consumer. In that case, you're going to go on to the next level. So, so as students play their carbon atoms and circulate through, they start to see patterns in the way that, uh, that, that what happens and where people end up as they go through these. And so it's pretty rare for people to end up in the, uh, the carnivore pool, for example. So the last thing, oh, the carbon dice game, another part of the carbon dice game involves tracing energy as, ma as well as matter. So they're using twisty tie twist ties to, uh, to simulate energy and, and associating that uh, with when the carbon is part of organic uh, materials, then they've got chemical energy associated with them. And when they go back to inorganic to carbon dioxide, they're going to drop off that chemical energy somewhere. Uh, so uh, there are also a set of PowerPoint animations. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, we can't show them as PowerPoint slides here. But we did make a video of some of the PowerPoint animations. And my understanding is that at this point, uh, Bryn's going to play right, the video and, for us. Um, is that right? So I'll go ahead and uh, launch that now. And then you can uh, narrate as it goes. So here we go with the animation. Okay. So I've got to see if I can time my narration to correspond with what happens in the video. 
about two and a half minutes long. Oh, no. Is this playing on other people? I'm seeing it play. Yeah, we're not seeing anything. Okay, oh. it's just taking a little while. We may while not be, I'll be in sync, but there is stuff moving to the atmosphere okay. CO2. Okay, so we're oh. just starting right now. Yeah, so, so okay, so we'll have to talk a little longer. So what we're seeing first is uh, there's a picture of, you know, the, the question is how do, how do pools and fluxes come into existence? And so we've got this animation saying carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, in, in the atmospheric pool, and then there's a producer pool that includes all the plants. Uh, and then there is a, cons a, per a herbivore pool that includes all the uh, herbation, the animals that eat plants, a carnivore pool, and finally a soil carbon pool. And so it's important for students to understand how what's, uh, what they see around them fits into these pools um, and to understand uh, that soil organic carbon uh, is both the living and non-living uh, organic materials that are in the soil. So now we want to switch over and start talking about fluxes, about how it is that part uh, that carbon moves from one pool to another. And for those purposes, we're going to collapse uh, the, the different forms of organic carbon down, down into a single uh, uh, organic carbon pool and talk about the flux between inorganic and organic carbon. Uh, so that's photosynthesis. And conversely, there's another flux the other way due to cellular respiration. And so what we're going to do here is end up explaining uh, the uh, Keeling curve. Um, it, we, you notice we've got this disclaimer here saying we're showing individual atoms, but don't believe that we're really talking about individual atoms because there are a whole lot of them in any ecosystem. And so now how can we use these pools and fluxes to talk about how uh, the size of the pools changes over time? And so you can see this is a, something showing what's happening in the summer when you've got a large photosynthesis flux and it's much larger than this you know, cellular respiration uh, flux. And that's contrasting to the winter when you, the cellular respiration flux is still going on and the photosynthesis flux is, is uh, gone down to near zero. Zero. And so now we've got our explanation in terms of pools and fluxes of that annual cycle in the Keeling curve. The end. The end, yes. And so uh, that's, that's the conclusion of our uh, presentation uh, uh, with, uh, you know, our finally ideas about instruction. And so now We've got one final uh, opportunity for reflection and discussion. Which we might do after. Yes, yeah, I'm not sure. If we're, yeah. we're, but <laughs> we're not sure what we're doing right now. That's OK. I, I, do, I do know what we're doing right now. We're going to go through. I'm going to show you a few of the um, resources NSTA has. And then we'll let you do, fill out all of you, fill out your surveys. And then we'll come back and sit, let Andy and Jennifer answer a few more questions. But just to get you all aware of what's going on here. Um, you can find out a lot about the standards first at the nextgenscience.org website. That's where the standards are. And also at the NSTA website, nsta.org slash NGSS. And if you're, we've had some great discussions in the chat room this evening. You can continue to be involved in discussions like that on the NSTA listserv, which is for members. Any member can be a part of. And anyone can be a part of our discussion forums in the NGS, in the Learning Center. We've been working our way through. We've got, again, coming in two weeks, our next in our series of web seminars about the core ideas in life science and others coming up in engineering and nature of science down, down the road. We, as we mentioned before, we've had a large number of web seminars on different parts of NGSS on practices, cross-cutting concepts, the physical science and earth science, disciplinary core ideas, and a piece on assessment. Uh, also, a number of different articles in our three uh, journals, Science and Children's Science Scope and the Science Teacher. Um, if you've been interested in NGSS, particularly about the practices, which is, I think, one of the most interesting aspects of, of the standards, I really would encourage you to check out our um, virtual conference. This is the first time we've ever done a virtual conference. 
be a day-long event, and we'll have sessions about different practices, modeling, explanation, argumentation, how engineering can be used. We'll have different breakouts for some for life science teachers, for elementary teachers, and so on. And a, a really great group of people involved in the presentations here, folks who are you know, NGSS writers, people who participate in the development of the framework, and a lot of other folks involved in, in research that I would, this is, should be a really good um, uh, day. I'm looking, I'm personally looking very much forward to it. Uh, everything you want to know about NGSS, you can find in the book. We've got the standards, we've got the framework. We also have a reader's guide, NCA has done to the framework and to the standards. And Roger Bybee, um, who headed the life science session section of the, writing the standards, has written a book called NGSS for Classroom Instruction, and most of his examples are from the life sciences. That's his area of expertise although it's applicable to any grade or any subject area. Um, as in all things, there's an app for that. You can get an app that has all the standards to NGSS on it. Um, hope to see you at our conference in Boston, April 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th. There'll be a day-long event on the 5th that freed all conference attendees about, about NGSS. To, um, and would encourage you to, if you're going to be there, to attend that. Uh, it's called the NGSS at NSTA Forum. And now that I can catch my breath for a second, I really do want to thank um, Andy and Jennifer for what I found to be an extremely interesting piece. As a, as a physics guy, I don't know a great deal of uh, life science here, but I'm learning a lot. And so with that, I will pass it to Bryn to do the next step. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ted. And uh, I wanted to echo your um, words of thanks to Andy and to Jennifer for presenting today. Fantastic presentation and really great to have the, uh, the teaching strategies as well as the content. Um, everybody, we can use our emoticon button. That's one with a face on it. And give Andy and Jennifer a round of applause. And wanted to thank you as well, Ted, for helping to facilitate our Q&A today. I also did want to thank the Carnegie Corporation of New York for sponsoring today's web seminar. And a thank you to the administration of NSTA for their support for our programs. A reminder to everyone that the web seminar does have a collection of related resources, including our archive as soon as we're wrapped up today, but also uh, journal articles and interactive content modules that are related to today's topic, so do check it out. Also, uh, a quick look at our upcoming programs. We're continuing with our NASA Explorer School series with these uh, great topics. And we have even more coming up at learningcenter.nsta.org slash web seminars. Thank you, everyone, for your participation today. And we look forward to seeing you again soon.